Hey, it's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com. I hope you're having a good day. Last week, I talked about why it's so difficult to find the right bass trap for your room, and I showed you a quick way to figure out whether you're looking at a pressure trap or a velocity trap, and what that means about how it works and how you're supposed to use it in your room. But so which trap should you actually get? Because when you go on the net, you'll find people with very good arguments who swear that the only real way to absorb low bass is to use a pressure trap. But you'll usually find just as many people who say, no, 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 you want to go for standard porous velocity traps, like standard insulation material traps. So who's right? Are pressure traps really the only solution? Especially since velocity traps or porous absorbers don't seem to make any sense as base traps when you look at their absorption coefficient. As I mentioned last week, you need to look at the bigger picture to make that decision. Depending on your budget and the size of your room, your strategy to treating your room will change. And that's what I want to show you today. When does it make sense for you to invest in a pressure trap? And when does it make sense to stick to velocity traps, aka porous absorbers or acoustic foam? What are the main questions you need to answer for yourself to make that decision? Let's get to it. At first, pressure traps or resonance traps really seem like the only proper solution. Like velocity traps, they don't seem to make any sense. Absorption increases as you go up in frequency into the mids and highs, and they don't seem to absorb much bass at all, and, and, unless you make them really, really deep. But even if you do, they absorb a lot more in the mids and highs than you'd actually need, and that can't be good, right? Here's how a properly designed and correctly tuned membrane trap absorbs bass on the other hand. And that seems perfect to like shoot down certain resonance like with a sniper rifle, right? So if you've got like two, let's say two peaks between 50 hertz and 200 hertz, you could just tune them to hit those exact peaks and they wouldn't do anything but attenuate those particular resonances in your room. And it's true. A, properly designed functioning membrane resonance absorber is a really, really good low frequency absorber. There's no doubt about that. The thing is that resonance absorbers have a few real world problems that become deal breakers when you either don't have enough time or passion or money or space. So let's start with the most obvious one, and that's the fact that you need to tune them. If you don't, you're not gonna hit the right frequencies. And best case, that means basically nothing's gonna happen. You're not gonna hit those resonances or pressure buildups that you're trying to absorb, and nothing's gonna happen. But worst case, you reduce the reverb time in a part of the spectrum that you really don't want to, and you actually make your room even more unbalanced. And to do that tuning, you need acoustic measurements in order to figure out what frequencies you need to tune them to, but then also afterwards, once you've built them, to verify that they actually work. And those kinds of measurements are actually surprisingly difficult to do, and so that costs time and money. And for some people, that alone is a deal breaker. The second problem with tuning membrane traps is to actually get the design right. Because the formulas that you use to calculate the resonant frequencies are really inaccurate because the models that they're based on are just really oversimplified. On top of that, the materials you use and how you build the thing also impacts the tuning frequency. So in practice, you usually end up with a, an actual tuning that is between five to 10 to 20 hertz below what you set out to do. But you won't find that out and figure out by how much until you've actually built them. I know I've got a diagram of that discrepancy somewhere in some book or paper, I don't know, but I just couldn't find it before I started shooting this video. The point is that again, this costs time or money because it significantly raises the complexity of getting these things to work. The third problem with tuned pressure traps is that you need to put them in the right spot. If you don't put them in an area of high pressure for the actual frequency 
that they're, they absorb, that they're tuned to, they just won't work. It's kind of like a solar panel that you put in the shade, like the performance just plummets. And that might seem like not the biggest issue to get right, but in small rooms, that can be a real problem. Because what if there is a door there or a window or there's just a piece of furniture that you don't want to move? Maybe the only spot where it'll work is like right in the middle of this one open wall. And like that's where you will have to put it, otherwise it just won't work. And it doesn't help that resonance absorbers need more space than you think. They aren't exactly small. Like this particular membrane trap tuned to 50 hertz is roughly 30 centimeters or a foot deep. Or is it actually tuned to 40 hertz? Because you don't know that until you build it, remember? And you need like three or four of them. I think that's what a lot of people underestimate. In order to get a significant effect, you need a few of these per target frequency. So just imagine putting 12 or 16 of these resonance absorbers, which are gonna be this big each, in your room. And at that point, you've only covered frequencies below maybe 150 hertz. What about the rest of the spectrum though? You still have to take care of reflections, but now you've got all these huge resonance absorbers in really inconvenient spots in your room, and you can't expect to just slap some insulation material on top of them and it to work by default. So what are you gonna do, just ignore reflections? Especially if you're in a small room, they don't have to travel very far and they carry a lot of energy which really impacts what you hear. I think you can probably tell where this is going, right? The thing is that in the real world, pressure traps aren't the end-all be-all because they're actually fairly expensive and difficult to use and they use up a lot of valuable space which can be a real problem in a small room. Depending on your situation, you may just not have the luxury to use pressure traps. If you're working on a budget and from a small room, you just don't have the space and the means to start your treatment with a tool that only takes care of the low frequencies. By the time you're done treating everything below 150 hertz, you're all out of space and money, and now you just don't have any way to take care of all the other problems that happen in the rest of the spectrum. Just quickly, by the way, you might be wondering, what about Helmholtz resonators? And the thing with Helmholtz resonators is that all in all, the problems are pretty much the same. The tuning is on one hand a little easier because the calculations are more accurate, but the problems are the same with the design and they have a very narrow absorption peak. So actually r hitting the right frequency that you need to absorb is quite tricky. All in all, the problems are pretty much the same as they are with membrane traps. Now let's compare that with velocity absorbers, aka porous absorbers. So sure, you also need to give up space in order for them to work in the low frequencies. There's just no way around that, whatever type of base trap you pick for your room. But if you optimize the material depth and the use of an air gap to tease out just the right amount of low frequency absorption before porous absorbers become kind of inefficient, they aren't as deep as you might actually think. And you can easily get decent, useful low frequency absorption down to around 40 hertz. It also pretty much doesn't matter where you put them as long as that to total depth is there, which makes them really useful and flexible to use them in small rooms or when they're like really oddly shaped or have like an inconvenient door or inconvenient window somewhere. And with any panel that you put in the room, because they work broadband, you're automatically taking care of any reflections that happen higher up in the spectrum. And finally, they're obviously just a lot cheaper. So you get to treat your whole studio and take care of a lot of other issues apart from the low end for the same price of just getting a few resonance absorbers. Sure, you're not gonna get quite as effective low frequency absorption from them, but usually it's good enough. Like think 80-20, sometimes good enough is just good enough. 
And if you do have some budget left at that point, and hopefully a bit of space, you can now take care of whatever is left over in terms of very low frequency absorption with like a few very strategically placed resonance absorbers. It's just way better bang for your buck to go about it this way. So if you need to decide between pressure traps and velocity traps, the first thing you want to check is your total budget. Like how much are you planning to invest in the treatment of your studio in total, right? So that includes material costs or for cost for panels, uh, the cost of labor and any help you might want to get in terms of uh, planning or design. Very roughly speaking, if that number is below around $5,000, you probably get more for your money for your investment if you follow a strategy where you get as much as possible out of uh, velocity absorbers or porous absorbers first. You need to control as much base as possible, but also reflections higher up the spectrum, all within the same panel design. I also like to add a diffuser front on top of that every once in a while to help uh, break up the high frequencies instead of absorbing them, and that really helps to keep the room lively and goes a long way towards not ending up with a dead sounding room. But only then, once you've done as much as you possibly can with velocity or porous absorbers, and you have some budget and some space left, should you attack those problematic sub-bass frequencies with some carefully selected resonance absorbers? And that brings me to the second question that you should ask yourself, and that is simply, how big is my room? If it's any smaller than, say, a small classroom, which is still, acoustically speaking, a small room, by the way, then if you follow a strategy that uses resonance absorbers first to focus on the low end, you'll probably end up with pretty half-baked results, simply because afterwards you'll have a hard time finding the space to do the rest of the treatment that you also need. But even if you have a larger space, but you're still on a budget, like I just mentioned, you're probably still gonna get more bang for your buck by following a porous absorber first strategy. So those are the two questions you have to ask yourself if you want to decide whether you should get a pressure trap or a velocity, aka a porous absorber base trap. How high is my total budget for treatment? Is it higher or lower than roughly $5,000? And second, how big is my room? is it smaller than a small classroom, then I will probably get more bang for my buck by doing as much as possible with velocity absorbers. Now there are a whole lot of other types of bass traps out there, but they all fall into one of these two categories, either they're pressure traps or they're velocity traps. But often the devil's in the details with a lot of these designs. If you're currently thinking about investing in some bass traps, but when you look at different products, you don't really know what you're looking at, then I highly recommend you check out my free complete guide to bass traps, which is linked in the description below. It lists pretty much all the different types of bass traps that you can find, of course, from companies on the net, but also from research papers and textbooks, even some of the more like obscure ones. And there are really simple descriptions in there on how they all work and like the pros and cons and how the different designs compare. But most importantly, a few strategies for you to figure out if they're the right approach for your room and how many you would need and how to place them correctly. I highly recommend you download that before you buy any base traps. It's absolutely free. But that's it for now. I hope that cleared things up for you regarding pressure traps versus velocity traps. I'll see you in another video.